It's Charles Botenston here talking about real estate in New York City. Everyone is talking about it. They're actually talking about it globally. All right. We went through a big, monstrous 2020, 2021, 2022, and here we are in a different marketplace. And there's a lot of headlines. There's a lot of clickbait headlines. If you want to know those clickbait headlines, just tune in on Tuesdays. Eric and I, my business partner, and we talk about all the headlines, but we actually read the story. I know it's shocking. We read the story and we decipher why you should buy, why you should not buy, why you should sell, why you should not sell. And we're going to be talking about the pros and the cons for both. And we're going to have a couple for both. And the reason being is that if it makes sense, then it's right for you. This whole thing about being dictated by the media, especially social media, by friends, by neighbors, by people that are not trusted advisors who don't know the market, who are not talking to people in the morning, in other words, us, we're talking to buyers and sellers all day, every day. We know the fears, the wants, the needs, the desires, uh, just anything that they consider something that would move them to buy or sell. We're hearing the conversations. So these are real buyers, real sellers. These aren't journalists. So we have essentially boiled it down to the pros and cons for both. We'll start, we'll start with selling first because obviously a lot of people are on edge about selling. They don't know if they could find a place. They have interest rates that are through the roof. Uh, there's low inventory and they don't know if they can get the price. So it's a big swath of negativity. Okay. So the pr let's go over the pros first before we go into the cons. The pros to selling right now is that you don't have any competition. Your competition in any other month for the last two and a half, three years was everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you would put your home on the market and everyone would try and bid on it. And then if they lost, then they would go to the neighbors and they didn't really care. And it was just competition was everywhere. It was competition between the buyers. It was competition with the sellers. Everyone was competing against each other. It was a dog eat dog world. Now, if you put your home on the market, you put it on right, you price it right. You're going to be getting a qualified buyer, but guess what? When you get your home on the market, you're not competing with 50 other homes. You're competing with now probably 25 or 20. You know, I'll give you an example. I was talking with a buyer yesterday and they're like, yeah, we're not really seeing what we want in the marketplace. I'm like, I know because there's sellers who don't trust the marketplace. So they're not putting their home on the market. There's buyers out there, but the sellers don't trust the marketplace. Understandable. I'm not blaming anything. It's just the reality that if when there's a hot market, sellers compete against other sellers, buyers compete against other buyers, but sellers compete against other sellers in a buyer's market. Yes, you're the only one on the market and the buyers have the advantage like it is right now. However, if you price it right, you get the home ready, it's going to sell because you don't have as much competition. So competition is much lower. Selling a pro to selling is that if you have equity, this is, this is the formula. You have equity in your home. So in other words, you bought it at 100,000 and it's now worth 200,000. You bought it at a million, it's now worth 1.3, whatever the case is. If you have equity in your home, there's two ways that you can actually do this. You can rent it out so long as the rent is roughly around the payment. Obviously it's rarely gonna be exact. And to be honest, you might lose money, but to be honest, losing $1,000 a month or selling it for 50,000 or 100,000 less, let's do the math, okay? so. Either rent it out, this is if, you're, if you have equity, or you have to think long term, okay? What were you doing 10 years ago? That's the question I always ask. What were you doing 10 years ago? To any buyer or seller, what were you doing 10 years ago? Uh, what year was that? And then they have to recall what was happening. Oh, we were actually coming out of the worst recession since the Great Depression. Oh. Oh, whoa, what a shock. It's one of those things that if you don't understand that time heals any kind of situation, especially if you're going to be in the next home long term. So if you're going to be in the next home 30 years, 15 years, 10 years, what is the next, you know, one and a half, two years of holding on to maybe get a little bit more money on your house? It's not worth it. I know a lot of sellers that just said, listen, Charles, I'm cutting ties. They're losing money. They lost a lot of money. And they're still just saying, listen, I don't care. I just don't want this to be in my portfolio. 
I want to cash out. And they lost money. But the thing is, you have to think about it, and this is what the conversation, I said, I can easily rent this out and then sell it for more money in three years and you're not gonna lose money. Thank you, Charles, but we're gonna go the selling route. And I, and I literally mentioned this many times because I want the best for the buyer or the seller. And if the seller wants to sell, we try and get the best price we can. We don't try, we get the best we can. And negotiation was hard bringing the buyer and the seller, the seller didn't want to come down, the buyer didn't want to come up. However, both wanted to do a transaction. Buyer was cash, seller wanted to sell, cut ties off my portfolio. Not as much competition. If you have equity, get rid of it. And listen, a lot of people, they just want to shed their investments. They just want to cash out. They just want the freedom of having cash in their bank, just in case. I know a lot of people that are just worried about, say, not having cash or wondering what's going on. And then you have other people that are saying that cash is worthless. This is the thing is that each person is individualized. Their fears are individualized. So for me, I'm very bullish on New York City. I saw in 2007 to 2008 to 2009 to 2010. Then I saw in 2020, 2021, 2022, and I know it's going to rebound because I see the rents, I see the data, I see the amount of people that are living here. There's no new homes that are getting built, and if they're getting built, it's just uber luxury. So the people that are, you know, the 80%, the 90% of New York City are going to keep on driving up the sales price and the rental price in the coming future. Like in the coming day, no. In the coming month, no. But if you're looking long term, that's the way to look at it. A negative to selling is if you are essentially either below equity, you bought at the height, and the height would be 2013 to 2017, right around there, 20, yeah, probably about 2017, and you essentially cannot rent it out for, you can't rent it out. I know a lot of owners, we have about 40 off-market properties where they're like, I have to live in here. This is, I have to live here. I can't sell it, I wanna sell it, and if I rent it out, I'm going to be losing money, but then I also can't buy wherever I'm going to live because the interest rates and the pricing is too high. So they're in this purgatory of, I can't sell it at the price I want. I can't buy at the price I want. I can't rent at the price I want, and I can't rent at the price I want. So they're just living in the home and they're very frustrated and it's very understandable. However, each person is individualized. So if this seller talks to a professional and we talk it over and we can say, Hey, listen, is an investment property. We can roll it over into another investment property, do an 1031 exchange, obviously talk to your attorney, talk to your accountant, talk to your tax advisor. The other is that use it as a second home. A lot of people have been doing that where they said, listen, I can't sell it at the price that I want. So I'm either going to rent it out or the second one is use it as a second home, put family members there, put yourself there and essentially rent somewhere else or buy somewhere else. If you can't sell it, the con to selling is if you need a certain price. And that certain price is dictated by, most of the time, honestly, is the seller. It has nothing to do with the equity or the bank or how much money they owe. They are actually gonna walk away with money, but they have this, this number in mind. But also, a little bit is dictated by the co-op, unfortunately. So those are the pros and cons of selling. Let's go into buying. Okay, so we'll go into the, the con of buying first, because there's a lot of, obviously a lot of pros of buying, but the con of buying is the number one thing that I ask when I first take on a client is, how long are you gonna spend in this home? I just took on a buyer yesterday, and they said, this is gonna be our long-term home. Long-term in New York City is about seven to 10 years. In the suburbs, it's probably 10 to 15 years or even longer. Um, it's definitely longer in the suburbs. But New York City long-term is about seven to 10 years because then they move on or they upgrade to a bigger apartment. So if you don't see yourself long-term in that studio or one bedroom, don't buy. But the problem is rents are, crazy right now. So that's the con of buying. The second con of buying is the interest rates. This is clear and present danger when it goes to co-ops. And co-ops are in this, also this, this dichotomy because they can't get the pricing they want, but they want to uphold the shareholders number of all the homes that have been bought. But the problem is, is that interest rates are cutting into the purchase price. So if monthlies are too high, the purchase price has to come down. It has to come down. You see it all over the place. If a maintenance is $5,000, as opposed to a maintenance, and a maintenance is HOAs or common charges, whatever you want to call it. So if the maintenance is, say, $5,000 in this two-bedroom, and the two-bedroom next door is 
2500 the one for 2500 is clearly going to go for more because the monthlies are lower so if you factor in the price with the interest rates there's a con to buying i also wrote this down if you're putting down 20 percent this is tough this is tough i've run the numbers over the last week for actually other buyers that have come into our world and unfortunately a lot of condos i'm sorry a lot of co-ops do not make sense the reason they don't make sense is because they're not going to get through the co-op board. The dent income ratio or the post-closing liquidity is just not there, unfortunately. So we have to either focus on condos, we either have to put down more money, or we have to look at a lower price point on co-ops. Okay, that's it. That's the reality. I wish it could be different. I wish you could buy a townhome for $50,000 and live there and rent out the other ones and cash flow $200,000 a month, but that's just not reality. Buying pro. This is obviously the last part. This is the caboose of the entire video because this is obvious. Um, the pricing right now, this is the thing, is that I'm having conversations with a lot of investors. And the investors say, if you find a good deal, the thing is, pricing has been adjusted in New York City for the last two years. So if you historically look at the building, you'll notice that the two bedroom you're looking at, I'll give you an example. Uh, someone's looking to buy a place on Park Avenue. And she asked, is this a good deal? And I historically looked at all the homes that have sold before COVID, and I said, this is actually about three to $400,000 less than similar, actually two bedrooms that have sold. So she came to me and she wants additional money off. But the problem is it's already adjusted for lower pricing. It's kind of like the original furniture or the original couch was $1,000. It didn't sell. So now it's on showcase for $850. It still didn't sell. Now it's at $650 but it's marketed as 650 and you walk in, you say, I want 500. It's like, it's already below a thousand dollars. It's already below what people have paid, which was a thousand dollars. So it has adjusted. So there is no good deal. There's never a good deal. Okay. Good deals are that the, the, good deals means that the seller's an idiot or it's in foreclosure or it's an auction or the bank's giving it away, or it's in a portfolio of 50 foreclosures. There are no good deals. You have to historically look at, in this building, what do one bedrooms go for? And historically in this building, what do four bedrooms go for? Three bedrooms, whatever the case is. Historically in the area, what, what do the three bedrooms usually go for that have two baths and a balcony? It's not historically right now because all the pricing has been adjusted. So yes, pricing has been adjusted. You can still get money off. And number one is it is in your favor to, and I forgot a con, I'll talk about a con in a second. It is in your favor to go in and not lowball. You have to be realistic because the owner is already in an antsy mood. They're already not happy that they have to sell at a loss or they have to sell at low pricing or whatever, or the agent hasn't brought them any offers, understandable. The listing agent hasn't brought them any offers. So that if a buyer comes in and lowballs, I'm telling you right now, the owners just, they're just not having it. They're just not countering. That's what I've noticed. They're just not countering or they're just saying, listen, it's already 20% off the asking price of, of the last two bedroom that sold in 2017, 2018. It's like you're getting the least expensive two bedroom in this building for the last eight or nine years. I think it's a good deal. That's a good deal. You have to historically look at it and then future project what it's going to do. It's probably going to go back to what it was eight or nine years ago. It's going to take a couple of years. That's why you have to look at your buying long term. One con I will say that I did not bring up is that you do have less inventory. That's why you have to come to either us or someone that knows off market properties. Again, we have about 40 off market properties. They're either rented out, a lot of them are rented out, and the reason being is that because the owner is completely not in New York City. They're either vacationing and they're never coming back, or they actually bought somewhere else and they're never coming back. So there's great opportunity, okay? It's not great deals, it's great opportunity to buy a home off the market. So if you have any questions or any topics you want us to cover, obviously drop it down below, and we will talk to you next week, and we'll. 
bring you the latest news because the news right now is all over the place and there's no statistics that are actually accurate. They interview one person and they call it a story and they st one statistic is irrelevant because it's not against another statistic. So <laughs> that's why we have to do the news show. So we'll come to you on Tuesday live. We'll see.